Counselling Resource Productions. My name is Rory Lees Oaks and today we're looking at person-centred therapy, the influential figures and historic development in context. So where to begin? Well, I guess a good place would be the predominant therapies that were around in the 1940s and there were two ideas in psychology, certainly in therapy. One was psychoanalysis and the other was behaviourism. Now in this presentation I'm not going to dwell on the mechanisms of these two therapies but there are two connections that connect these therapies and the one connection, the first one, is, deter det is deterministic. What does that mean? Well it means that the therapist is an expert. It means that the skill and knowledge of the therapist is paramount in the success of the therapy. And it also would have us believe, these two therapies, that humans have no free will. In the case of behaviourism, that we are programmed machines that are act on punishment and reward. So what changed or challenged the dominance of these two therapies? Well, to do... To do that and to look at that, we go to America in, in the 1940s and we meet a man called Carl Rogers and he's the creator of person-centred therapy. He's credited with developing the new therapeutic idea. And he wrote in 1961, in my early professional years, I was asking the question, how can I treat or cure or change this person? So there we have this notion of the therapist being an expert. He went on to say, now I would phrase the question in this way, how can I provide a relationship which this person may use for his own personal growth? So he'd moved from being an expert, someone highly trained in psychological techniques, to someone who realised that the relationship was the most important thing within the therapy and also that clients had free will. This was called non-directive therapy. The client's an expert, and humans have free will. And it can't be emphasised how revolutionary this was in psychological circles. You know, it was an absolute revolution for somebody from the, the counselling or therapeutic community to dare to voice these ideas. What happened? Why did Rogers come to his conclusions? Well, to look at that, we need to go to the Rochester Society um, for the Prevention of Cruelty to Children. He worked there between 1928 and 1940. And one particular day, he was working with a child who was having behavioural difficulties. And he tells this story of how near the end of his time at Rochester, He'd been working with a highly intelligent mother whose son was presenting serious behavioural problems. Roger was convinced that the root of the trouble lay in the mother's early rejection of the boy, but no amount of gentle strategy on his part could bring her to this insight. So here we have Rogers the expert. Here we have Rogers using all these skills and knowledge to help convince um, the mother that it was the rejection, the mother's early rejection of the boy. But she was having none of it. In the end, he gave up. And as they were about to part, she asked if adults were taken for counselling on their own account. When Rogers assured her that they were, she immediately requested help for herself and launched into an impassioned outpouring of her own despair, marital difficulties, confusion and sense of failure. It would have seemed for Rogers that real therapy and indeed person-centred therapy, began at that moment and it was ultimately successful. Rogers went from being an expert to listening and he believed that if he offered three things that therapy would be successful. Being empathic, trying to see the world through the client's eyes, being non-judgmental, offering no judgment or criticism and also being genuine and real. It was a change of direction. And Rogers goes on to write, this incident was one of a number which helped me to experience the fact, only fully realised later, that it is the client who knows what hurts, what direction to go, what problems are crucial, 
what experiences had been deeply buried. It began, it began to occur to me that unless I had the need to demonstrate my own cleverness and learning, I would do better to rely upon the client for direction and movement in the process. So there's Rogers moving then from what he describes as cleverness and learning from himself to trusting on the client for direction and movement of the therapy. So who influenced Rogers? Well, it's kind of difficult to get a handle on who directly influenced him, i.e. a conversation that changed his mind. Certainly the, the encounter at Rochester put him on the path of looking at his ideas and changing his ideas. But we might get a clue of where, where Rogers came from by his, his, his education, and certainly his education as a teacher. He attended Columbia Teacher Training College and he received his PhD in 1931. Um, he'd already got his MA from Wisconsin. And he came across at Columbia two really influential people. One was William H. Kilpatrick, who developed something called the Project Method. Child centeredness in education. Where have we heard this before? Children directing their own learning, children being seen as individuals. Sounds familiar. And also a man called John Dewey. John Dewey was a philosopher, psychologist, educator, and he was a Marxist. And I can't emphasise too strongly what it would have been like to be a Marxist in America in the 1950s. They were locking people up for being Marxist. So this was another revolutionary thinker. And a bit of an anarchist, really, in, in a kind of a soft sense of the world. He was talking about people being free to be who they wanted, not to be controlled. And I can't help but think that these two educators may very well have altered Rogers' thinking. Certainly, when Rogers worked at um, Rochester, he was in contact with Otto Rank and used Rankian therapy. Um, on some of his clients. Now, I'm not going to go into Rankian therapy in this presentation, but I think it, it's telling that Carl Rogers invited Otto Rank to Rochester to conduct a three day seminar on his new post Freudian practice of therapy. The clues in the name post Freudian, in other words, a movement from Freud's ideas into different ideas. And we don't know what Rogers, Rogers learned during the seminar. No one can be certain, but one month after visiting Rochester in July 1936, Rank published two books. And these two books were effectively promoting autonomous therapy that clients could actually um, heal themselves. And we know Rogers put a lot of stock in Otto Rank's theories. We know also that Rogers had a dialogue with Rollo May. Uh, May can be credited with being the editor along with Ernest Angel and Henry F. Allenberger, of the first American book on existential psychology. It's called Existence. It's published in 1958. And it influenced not only Rogers, um, but also Abraham Maslow, who we're going to look at next, into developing humanistic psychology. And in fact, they developed the human potential movement in America, which flourished in the 1960s. Abraham Maslow... Well, Maslow coined the term third force in psychology to describe the humanistic approach. A lot of people think Rogers came up with the idea of the third force, but it was Maslow. And the reason he called it the third force was to emphasise how it differed from psychodynamic and behaviourist approaches. Remember, we saw those earlier in the presentation, Freud and Skinner, and they dominated psychology, at least in North America in the 1950s. So these were influential figures that I guess Rogers um, reflected on and took an interest in their theories. Carl Rogers wrote a book called The Way of Being and he says the way of being with another person which is termed empathic means temporarily, temporarily living in their life, moving about in it delicately without making judgments. To be with another in this way means that for the time being you lay aside the views and values you hold for yourself in order to enter the other's world without prejudice. A complex, demanding, 
strong yet subtle way of being. And uh, Rogers put a lot of stock in the, the, the therapist's personal qualities of the relationship, of trust being built up between the client and the therapist. So the client could talk about emotional blockages, things that were finding, they were finding difficult and talk about them in an open and honest way. When he died, the Guardian newspaper called him the Quiet Revolutionary, and certainly this was a name that went with him throughout his professional life. His first major theatrical contribution came in the early 1940s, when as a young psychologist, he audaciously advocated um, the belief that humans were basically good and could be trusted to die at their own lives. And the reason I laugh is, is that I could imagine the gasps and horror of the psychological community who uh, heard Rogers say, what, humans are basically good and could be trusted with their own therapy? Um, you could see hands on heads and, and gasps of indignation. This, pers this perspective was an anathema. Well, that kind of means it was just totally against the current thinking to the then idea, prevalent idea, the Freudian view of therapy as a process of helping people control their uncivilized impulses. And I said I wouldn't go into um, sci sci Freudian ideas, but there is an idea in psychoanalysis that basically people are evil, that they need therapy to, to contain their subconscious desires. And, um, and Rogers dismissed this completely. In addition to this more optimistic view of human nature, which was Rogers' ideas, not Freud's obviously, he also formulated a total new treatment approach based on the more personal characteristics of the therapist than on any other techniques of formal training. He challenged the psychotherapy community and this is, this is why it was so important. He challenged them. They had a very cosy ideas and he came along and he put his stick in the pot and he stirred it up and he formally articulated that the, the facilitative conditions of empathy, positive regard and genuineness on the part of the therapist were necessary and sufficient conditions for therapy. Nothing more was needed and more to the point, nothing less would do. And I find it interesting, even in the modern ideas of behaviourist therapies such as CBT and transactional analysis, which is an idea developed on um, Freud's ideas, they would both say both agree that the relationship and the quality of the relationship is an important factor in the therapy succeeding. Might not be everything as it is in person-centered therapy, but if you think about it, you need to trust the person you're working with. If you're a client, you need to trust the person and you need them not to be judgmental, to be real people, genuine people, and also to try and see the world where you're coming from. If you want further information, um, if you're watching on the VLE, then you click the resource tab above and you'll get sent to a really good resource. If you're viewing this again through the VLE, then you'll be able to pick up the PowerPoint presentation and there's lots of hyperlinks um, for you to go on to for really good, re really well written and relevant information. If you're watching on YouTube, then I'm afraid you're going to have to type them out, but they're there for you. And finally, thank you for watching.